I had no idea when I made a zine in 2004 that I, when I was like 23 years old, that I'd be 40 fucking years old and still doing this thing. That was Broke Ass Stewart, and I'm Jeff. Welcome to Storied San Francisco. In part one, you heard about Stuart Shuffman's ancestors and his life up to the point when he moved to San Francisco. Now, in part two, Stuart picks up where he left off, chronicling jobs, zines, TV shows, books, and other stuff he started from the ground up. He ends this episode with his vision for San Francisco post-pandemic. Here's Stuart. I outgrew Santa Cruz and so San Francisco I came here and it was perfect and like I just fell in love with the city there was just so much going on constantly and I was like you know um, you know my first apartment was on, is in, was in the lower no upper Haight at uh, uh, Haight and um, right in front of Bonavista Park so Haight and Masonic no Masonic yeah. is the big intersection no one, one before Masonic God, it's, it went not uh, Masonic Central it doesn't matter Haight and Central Haight yeah, and Central okay, okay, okay. and uh, yeah I um, me and my buddy Monty we uh, shared a room that didn't have a door. Yes. <laughs> and we had two air mattresses that we yes, lived on did. each. Yeah. So we each lived on one air mattress. And uh, um, did you think it was expensive? God, it was so long ago. I don't even remember. Because we shared, yeah. we, we, I think we were paying a few hundred bucks a month. I don't remember. This yeah. was like 20 years ago. You know? Yeah, but it's like, I'm just thinking like being young. It, it wasn't and, more and expensive than Santa Cruz, really. Oh, okay. Because Santa Cruz was so expensive because there was all these college kids and the dot com thing had just happened. Mm-hmm. You know, the dot com thing had one. just popped. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so like even like even like in UC Santa Cruz in nineteen in two thousand when me and my buddy Jeremy had an apartment together that we shared a one bedroom, uh, it was still like twelve hundred dollars a month in in the year two thousand. Yeah, in and Santa you, Cruz, and and you just like made shit work. It didn't matter so much. Right. Yeah. And, and going out wasn't expensive. Well, yeah. I mean, you just like, you drink just shitty beers with your shitty friends. Beers, and, like, yeah. 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 Um, and what kind of, like, so, so I guess when you first moved here, what were you thinking you'd do here? Oh, when I first moved here, well, I was came, you when know, I had that internship. Or were you thinking about that yet? Were you thinking, like, oh, I'm going to come to San Francisco and well, do I had, Or were you just like, I'm going to get a job? I had that internship, and I was like, I want to be a fucking music promoter. And then I, long story short, I went back to Santa Cruz and. Finished uh, that year, threw some concerts there. Threw a couple really cool concerts. I threw one concert that was uh, CeeLo, Pharoah Monch, Cardinal Official, some other people. It was cool. A bunch nice. of cool hip hop shit. Nice. And then uh, I came up to uh, the city after that, and I'm still trying to do concerts. And long story short, I had one that just totally fucking blew up in my face, lost a bunch of money, oh, lost, uh, lost my buddy's money. It was a whole fucking disa- disaster. So then it was great because then I got out of that whole thing. And then um, where was that? Uh, the concert was going to be in uh, Salinas. It was like, oh, okay. Yeah, it was supposed to be like a country festival. I don't fucking know. It's a long story. I don't want to go into. Okay. It's a sour story. Okay. That's for another time. And uh, when and where was Brocast Stewart born? That didn't like, exist yet. Okay. That, that uh, so, it was born so, here. so yeah. So that that fell apart, and then um, I. Uh, I had to move in with my girlfriend at the time because I couldn't pay rent because I didn't have any money. The Siltia? Yeah, that was Siltia. Okay. And, um, and then I got a job and I, uh, uh, lots of really random jobs for a little while. Let's hear some of them. Yeah, right? yeah. the best one was Mrs. Doosan. Mrs. Doosan's hats. So Mrs. Doosan okay. uh, was on Fillmore Street, Upper Fillmore, and she was like a, a, a 300-year-old black lady who took no shit from anybody, right? Awesome. And so I remember like, dude, I was so afraid of her. Like, like she like, she made like, Remember this one because I worked one weekend. I only worked for her one weekend. It was like the Fillmore Jazz Festival, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And um, she uh, made these two white cops like shake in their boots. They, oh, they came in to ask her to do something. She's like, she's like basically, you motherfuckers don't talk to me like that. I'll call Willie Brown right now. He buys hats for her. Fuck you and fuck you. I'll have your fucking jobs. And I was just like, this woman is is amazing, and I'm enamored and I'm terrified. You totally, know. Totally. And so, uh, long story short, years later, so we actually I think dying uh, in um, uh, Laguna Honda, okay. right? Is that what it's called, Laguna Honda? The, Laguna Honda, yeah, yeah, the yeah. hospital. So, okay, I, yeah, so, yeah. so I remember uh, this, reading this interview with her right right before she died, and she goes, she, she was a pistol man. She goes, she goes, man, I'm up here thinking like, why do all these assholes get to live and I have to die? <laughs> But yeah, Correct. She was a real character, and, and anyway, so so I worked for her one weekend, and uh, she sent me wear this hat during the weekend, right? And I went home with it, 
and I came back the next day or uh, you know that, that Monday or something that ADC if I still had a job mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, to give her the hat back and she mm-hmm. goes oh no baby you don't work here anymore but you can keep the hat oh and nice. I was like, well thanks Mrs. Dusen anyway she was a real character but um, they ended up having a job for, for longer than a weekend at uh, Z Chocolato in North Beach mm-hmm I was there for a few months, and um, it's on Columbus. Yeah, it's on Columbus. Right. Okay. And that's why it's still there. It's still there. Awesome. And that's why I met the Brogast Stewart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what can you tell us about that? I'm right? not gonna tell you about that. I gotta go by. No. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, so I was working um, there, and um, uh, this guy from my neighborhood, growing up in San Diego, Andy. Um, what's his fucking last name? I don't remember. Can't think of his last name. But um, Andy. Can- San Diego. San Diego. Yeah. But he grew up down the street from me. He was a few years older than me. He was maybe a, a senior when I was a freshman or like gra- had already graduated when I was a freshman, but lived down the block from me. And he came in with the woman who's now his wife, Melissa. To the chocolate store. To the cho- yeah. yeah. And I was like, Andy Keith. That's right. Okay. Hey, Andy Keith, what the fuck are you doing here, you know? And now uh, his, his, the woman who's now his wife, now Melissa Keith, but they were just engaged at that time. And uh, uh, as, 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 she's, as they're walking out, she gives me her business card and it says, travel writer. And I said, I want to be a travel writer. So I decided to become one. I made myself one, and I made, started making zines. I made Broke Ass Stewart's Guide to Living Cheaply in San Francisco. It was a 33-page zine or something like that. And uh, started putting them in like city lights and other places and selling them from my backpack, and that got real popular. And so then I, I did a second one, and I got that in the hands of people at Lonely Planet. And um, they liked that, and I went through the, you know, some trials for them, and eventually I got to go to Lonely Planet, go to Ireland for Lonely Planet and write about it. And it was, it was a per- perfect timing in my life because um, I had just broken up with Tia, and we'd been together for like three and a half years, my first like serious breakup mm-hmm. uh, for a serious relationship ending, and I was like, uh, I, there's no better way to get over a broken heart than go someplace else and exactly. hook up with strangers, you know? Like, exactly, yeah. And so that's what I did for like a few months. It was, it was, it was awesome. Like, Ireland's an incredible country. It's, Still never been. No, it's great. You know, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a people that likes to bust balls and shit talk. And I was like, I fit right in. This is great. You know. <laughs> um, so that was like 2006. 2006. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, did you write? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I did all the research on that trip, and then I came back and wrote for like six months. You know. Um, Got it. Okay. I mean, being a travel writer in that capacity was weird because you have to be two people. You have to be the gregarious, outgoing person on the road doing the research, and then you have to come home and like be an introvert and like not leave the house for, for months at a time right but um and so after after uh doing that you know um you know i was like i, I want to do still do broke ass tour because remember it was still a zine then right right i think the website so is, like were you literally going to kinko's or well at first i went to kinko's and did the first one like myself and then after that i found there's a place i don't know if it's around anymore it's called it was called pit printing p-i-p mm-hmm. then it changed the name to kick printing k-i-k i don't know if it's around anymore but i was just like pay them to do my zines for me because there's like it, time money rise right and then i but you know, I was in like thirty odd, some odd stores, and I did all the distribution by myself with my my shoes, my backpack, and my bus pass. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I want to I want to do this uh, for real, real. Right. What can I do? And not no joke, I got a book deal on Craigslist. Okay. That's right for my book deal. Okay. Uh, I always say this. If you've listened to me talk before, this is a joke I always say. But I, I was I always say I was looking for a blowjob, and I got a book deal instead. You know, <laughs> which is only kind of true. Uh, but <laughs> which part? Yeah. Right. But yeah, I got a book deal, and that ended up doing. Broke Ass Tour became a book. Broke Ass Tour is kind of living cheaply in San Francisco. And it was a, a two book deal. So we did the New York book as well. I moved out to New York for a year. Right. And I did research the New York book and wrote it when I came back here. Bro- Broke Ass Stewart's Guide to living, living Cheaply in, in New York. York. Yeah. Okay. At that point, Got it's it. so long ago. Like that book, the New York book came out in 2008. So even yeah, that's the a books, long time ago. Do they hold up? I mean, the, the, the writing does. Right, uh, the spirit. But, but yeah, like but I mean, the like, a lot of places gone, and the, yeah. Gone. They're like time capsules now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's important too. Um, but, so, don't, but don't let anybody charge you full price for them. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. um, so when did uh, the thing that is broke ass Stewart's like? I, well, I guess partly goddamn website, but like you know publishing and, and everything that you do. When did that start? Uh, when I became, when I became a publisher? As no no as like, do you trace what you do now? Like, is it tra- you trace it back to those? The zine. First, the, the zine. It also with the zine, yeah. And the books and all that. Because the zine like started me getting like a small underground following, and that thing just kind of grew and grew. And then like um, the um, website was originally just a place to sell zines and, and stickers and shirts, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, the book came out, and so then it became. Uh, and around when I was living in New York is when I f- really like 2008 or 2009. No wait, I was there in 0708. So the end of 2008 is when I started like um, 
putting content on the site that wasn't, per there was just like, you know, like it was originally stuff from the book and then weird things I thought about, right? And then 2009 is when I really started like making it more of a destination. Mm -hmm. And starting then, uh, and then that's kind of grown, you know, obviously it's a thing now. When did the journalism part of it start? Well, it's so funny because I don't even really think of myself well, as a I journalist. Can, I know I hate that I, word. I, 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 I pay journalists to do stuff. Right. But like, I don't really, I'm considering myself a, a lot of things, a storyteller and a, uh, a, a shit talker and a bunch of things, you know, not shit talker, shit stirrer. Uh, but journalism, I mean, I pay journalists, but I don't necessarily am a journalist, if that makes any sense. Well, I just think it's like, it's kind of a version of what you've always done of like, here's what's going on in the city. Yeah, totally. So, um, natural per natural evolution, I would say. But so, I've been starting doing that. I mean, honestly, the, the website started as like, um, but once it started becoming like a destination, it was like, Cheap bars and restaurants and stuff, just like the books. And then um, as I grew up and matured, so did the brand Broke Ass Tour, you know. And um, there and there was always, like, you know, anti-capitalist, socialistic fucking um, undertones. Mm -hmm. uh, always. Even in the books, you know. Um, but they became more pronounced as, as, as you know, we, it needed to. Right. You know. And um, it's now, it's been like an, a, what it is now for a long time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse. Um, right. Um, and it's a trip because um, I definitely start. I didn't ever imagine this. You know, I mean, when I started, literally, I made my first zine. I was like, maybe I can have a few extra dollars to go to Burning Man with. You know, exactly. And uh, and I did. I've never been back since. Honestly, Burning Man was great once, and, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, but like money for burritos and yeah, cheap yeah. Beer. It, was, it was literally like yeah. I had no intentions of. I had no idea when I made a zine in 2004 that I, I when I was like. 23 years old that I'd be 40 fucking years old and still doing this thing I'm applauding with one hand it's fucking awesome <laughs> that's great where's your other hand if you're only applauding well, one hand you know <laughs> I don't want to know <laughs> um, yeah it's weird and there, it's funny because like there's some days where I wake up I'm like I'm doing the fucking thing you know right. like I'm really proud of myself and some days I'm like have I living up to my potential have I done enough yeah because there's always more I want to do and um, you know, and I've done a lot of cool stuff. I've had my own television show. I you know, to talk about that. I've, I've fucking, let's, I've, let's I've had my writing it. translated into four languages. I've gotten paid to travel the world and write about it. Let's you know? hear the t the TV show story. How'd that TV come show about? was awesome. It was like one of the best things I ever did, man. I, I created and hosted my own travel TV show on IFC called Young, Broken, Beautiful. I had to travel around the U.S. exploring the weird and wonderful in different cities. And uh, man, uh, at one point I thought I might be the next Anthony Bourdain, but it didn't work out. I got real close though. Was it fun? It was. It was so fun. Where all, for those who haven't seen it, where all did you go? I went to um, uh, San Diego, <laughs> yeah. uh, New Orleans, yes. uh, Baltimore, yes. Detroit, Memphis, and uh, Boston. Awesome. But, you know, in a way, um, you know, having this thing where, like, I was on the, you know, TV nationwide, right? right. And traveling with this entire circus of people yeah. where I was the focal point and where I went there was a camera in front of me uh, was an incredible experience but like I could definitely see like in a way one of the best things that happened to me in a way was that it did not get picked back up hmm. at least in terms of my personal growth mm -hmm. uh, because um, it's really humbling to go from that to bartending six months later right you know okay and I think like that really. Uh, Did you want to keep doing it, or were uh, you I like would have loved to do it. Okay. It was it was so great. It was so much fun. Yeah. But you know, it didn't get picked back up. It, probably part part of it was that like um, we shot this great show, had it in the can, everything was shot, and we turned it in to be edited. And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, we're a, a comedy network now. Oh god. And like, well, we shot a travel show. Right. There's funny parts, but it's a travel <laughs> show. And they're like, yeah, but make it funny. And so, yeah. and so that's a different show. In, in the in the in the edit. They put in like literally like slide whistles and shit, which is like really oh, slide whistle. Oh yeah. But you know what? We we made an excellent fucking show, and it ended up being a, a pretty damn good show. Awesome. You know. And what year was that about? 2011, 10 years ago. 11. Okay. Do you want to talk about running for mayor? Sure. What do you want to know? What the hell? <laughs> I like I'm this. feigning ignorance. Like yeah. I was around for I, that. But. I, you know, out of all the stupid shit I've ever done, it was the smartest. Okay. I mean, like. Uh, I had known. I, I knew I wasn't gonna win. There was no way I was gonna win, but like it was an opportunity to like. Uh, it's like one part street theater, one part uh, you know, uh, a political performance art, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, another part just like kicking up dust and getting people to pay attention to things they need to get paid attention to. I've heard you say, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. That that you that part of it was that you just you kind of wanted to. 
talk with and debate with uh, Ed Lee. Oh yeah, I wanted, yeah, all of the above, you know. So uh, did it check all those boxes? Oh yeah. Like the only way I could have won that, the only way I could have lost that election is if I had won that election. Because right. then I would right. have to be mayor. Could you imagine being mayor of this thing? No. You're fucking terrible. No. Uh, who wants to be fucking mayor? Yeah. Um, but you know, people people would say, "Hey, Stuart, are, are, are you running for real or is this a joke?" And I'd right. say, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> Any, uh, you know, any experiences along the way that year in the campaign that, you know, you're like, oh, I mean, changed you? Or? I mean, just, no, I mean, just solidified how broken the entire system is. Like, just yeah. to run, just to run for mayor, I had to get $5,000. Right. Uh, and, you know, and luckily my grandmother had money and I was able to get that from oh, her. Shit. She actually gave that to me, which is really nice, you know, but otherwise I would not have been able to, you know, otherwise you have to get like X amount of signatures and each signature is worth like less than... I don't know, like 50 cents or some of that. So I didn't have, we had to get like something like 11,000 signatures, Jeez. which is like, how, how long is that going to take, you know? Right. And you probably have to get like 15,000 because like if some of them aren't going to be accepted by the registrar, you know? Exactly. Or, you know, and so, and so, um, what was the, de- what were the debates like? There was only, there wasn't really one, there was, there wasn't debates. There was like a, a, a forum of sorts. Okay. Okay. And it was all it was six of us. There's all six of us who were running, mm-hmm. uh, including Ed Lee. It was a congenial. Yeah, yeah, nice enough. I, yeah. I, mean, I just, me and actually, Nato Green and I prepped. Nato helped me prep, um, and we just wrote some zingers and some funny stuff. But really, Amy Farrowice won that one. She was on fire. Nice. Let's talk about Broke Ass Stewart, the the entity, the person and the entity going into the pandemic. Okay, like, let me get a drink. Go ahead. Right. Do you want one? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm good. All right. I'll be right back. Okay, yeah. So, so you want to talk about internet haters? No. <laughs> I, sh- I, I no, want to I'm talk just, about whatever you want to talk about. No, I um, The internet is such a fucking weird place. Yeah, correct. It's like it's the way that, that information moves, and it's so quickly that like, um, it's really just the loudest people are the one who get to uh, frame the conversation, mm-hmm. no matter how wrong or how right they are. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and so because of that, like, just shit. I'm just so so disenchanted with the internet, honestly, right now. Mm-hmm. It's like wh- this thing that like um, was supposed to be the information superhighway <laughs> is now just like you know a monster truck rally, you know, yeah. in, a, in a parking lot. That's being generous. Yeah, right. It's terrible. Yeah, and <laughs> safe to say it hasn't lived up to its potential. Like, there's uh, obviously there's some good shit. Sure, but is it worth it? Do you think? I don't know. Uh, I, I wrote about this in my examiner column, uh, which actually, side note, I haven't told you about this. My examiner column is ending, and I'm switching over to SF Weekly. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. In a couple weeks. Okay. Yeah. But in my examiner column, I wrote an article that's like, is the internet worth it? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's cool that we, could, we don't get lost anymore, and it's cool that I can, you know, order fucking curry to my bed when I'm really hungover. Right. But, like, is it worth, like, the subversion of democracy? Mm-hmm. Is it worth, like, a bunch of assholes being like, I don't got to wear a mask because Fuhrer Trump tell me not to, you know? Like, is it worth it? I don't know. I don't yeah. know if the internet's worth it. Quick side note, um, I remember I, the first person, first like politician I heard talk about the internet was Bill Clinton, and he was like, "We gotta, you know, build the internet ev- for everyone and every like." And I was thinking like, "Oh, you mean like people in the country have to have the internet and people in the?" Aaron and I went on a road trip in mm-hmm. May. We uh-huh. went to we went to Idaho, Montana, Eastern Washington. I remember Utah. seeing your updates. Yeah, holy fucking shit! They do not need the internet. <laughs> To what you're saying, like all the bullshit out there, and they've just like it, it just stoked the racism and the shittiness that was already. Well, in I them. tell you what, history it's crazy. Assuming that hi- history can actually be written correctly, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey will be looked at as collaborators, as far as I'm concerned. I hope so. Because, like, they, they knew what they were doing and they allowed it to happen, mm-hmm. or they said, I can't change anything. Mm-hmm. Fuck that. Mm-hmm. Well, what Fuck do we that. do about it? Well, here's, here's the thing what it, do we do about it? I mean, there needs to be some kind of legislation. I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, I don't know. Here's the thing: if I if I know that if I post on my broadcast the broadcast your page, and I use words like money or dollars or thing, I I know for a fact I can see they turn down the virality of a post because they want me to pay them, right? Yeah. So if they can tune in on those words, they can definitely tune in on fucking the fucking fascist the bullshit. You know what I'm the, saying? Yeah. Yep. So 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 Sasha Baron Cohen fucking had some shit a while ago that was so smart. He goes, man, if, if Adolf Hitler was alive today, Mark Zuckerberg would let him run like you know ads for Hitler Youth. You know? Yep. Yep. But anyways, okay. I digress. Yeah. Um, we were gonna talk about. So let's talk about um, the pandemic. Oh. What that, pandemic? That, that we're still still in, uh-huh. by the way. What about it? Your personal experience, the broke ass experience. Oh, um, man, it was really tough. I, at the very very beginning, I thought, well, this is it, broke ass tour, it's over. I mean, uh, we make money in three ways. We make money through um, 
advertising, often direct ads, like, you know, let's say, um, a, uh, you know, let's say the the symphony wants to sell tickets. They might advertise with us to, you know. Right. Uh, which is just kind of funny thing that symphony actually sells tickets with brokeassdoer.com, which is a whole other fucking thing. <laughs> I love you guys at symphony. You're great. Um, uh, so that's one way we made money. Another way is through selling uh, products. Uh, mm -hmm. The t-shirts sell whatever, but like it's really like the, the passports we do, which is like coupons for bars and restaurants. Mm -hmm. And the third way is Patreon. Beer and coffee. Beer, coffee, wine. Yeah. yeah. Wine. Okay. Sorry. And uh, then, sorry. And then Patreon. And Patreon. And so when everything went to shit, uh, there's no more advertising. Mm -hmm. There's no more... Uh, bars and restaurants mm -hmm. so all of a sudden like two thirds of the income disappeared and that was left with Patreon right. and like I was like well this could be it and luckily thankfully uh, people stepped up and really joined pa Patreon and really like boosted that it's 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 great you know I mean it's still like still needs to grow it, the future really of, of all um, independent media has to be even even not even independent honestly even corporate media ultimately will have to be user supported right and so I mean if you're listening now and uh, you like what we do at BrokeAssTour.com, please join the Patreon. We have really fun perks. You get postcards in the mail uh, and a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, postcards I mean, with hidden messages. Yeah, did you, did you like that? Did you see it? I haven't done them. I don't know if anybody actually yet. did it yet. I have. Well, <laughs> I, I have things to do. Whatever. I will get, I'll it's not get like you have a it. life. Come on. No, you wait I, by the mailbox every day for my fucking postcards. Anyway, yeah. so uh, yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, I was like, you know. We had to cut like a lot of uh, staff, and uh, how many people do you have working? Uh, I mean, full time is just me and Alex, my business partner. Mm -hmm. But um, we have like editors and writers and stuff like that. But like, we had to like at one point we we're like, well, what we just gonna, it looks like just be me and Alex for a while, and that's it, you know? Right. And then luckily uh, we got you know a little bit of grant money. We got like I think like we got brought, like I think we got a Google Journalism grant for like five thousand dollars. That okay. was a nice little bump. Uh, helped us like you know, and then you know all the lovely people on Patreon really stepped up, and our Patreon. It's probably double now than it was at the beginning of the pandemic, maybe. Okay. Which uh, really helped. And one you, silver lining. Yeah. To the absolutely. Nastiness. You know? Well, yeah. I, think, I think I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic is like, I know it's not just uh, I broke through, but it's like anything, anybody, anywhere who like uh, did shit that people like. People are like this is, could be gone. I got a job. I have a job. I can give them five bucks. Right. You know, and like and seeing that happen has been magnificent and beautiful. Yeah. And like I mean, yeah. seeing like. I mean, honestly, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was, like, hoping that, like, uh, we'd learn as a culture and a society a lot more than we did. But, I remember um, that. Yeah, man. I was it's like, oh, like, Yeah. I mean, because, like, look, we just just experienced an incredible amount of universal basic income, and it's been very successful for right. a lot of people, right. as, we, as we've seen. How so many people have not gone back to their shitty jobs because they've been able to have uh, something like universal basic income for the past year, you know? Mm -hmm. They've been able to go back to school or, like, stay home with their kids and raise their kids. And mm -hmm. that's a whole other conversation. Um but and some people it did it did change some people for yeah. sure like you said like the the Patreon numbers went up yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, so, and so the some people some people did take the good out of sure this sure horrible I mean, there, there human are, fucking tragedy our, our society did not unfortunately but like but um Correctly. but like you know people individually have been like yeah I, I can contribute I I can do more in my community right and 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 so much that so much that has come out you know um there's so much mutual aid that popped up you know like uh, people like well look. We're gonna start a little kitchen and like start serving people who need food, you know. And like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a uh, in North Beach. There was the uh, neighborhood. Fuck, uh, Shafa started it. Uh, neighborhood, something alliance. I don't remember. Basically, like they started making sure that everybody in North Beach could be fed. Nice, you know. Um, and we were With Jeremy Strong. What's that? Or, yeah, sorry, yeah. Jeremy Fish. Jeremy Fish had his Stay Strong, strong San Francisco mm -hmm. stuff like things like that. The yeah, community yeah. supporting the community. It was amazing. The people supporting yeah. the people. Yep. And I think that hopefully that'll stick with us, you know. Yeah. On an individual level, since since we learned that we can't trust the we can't we can't rely on the government, you know. When right. it should be the opposite. In these situations, it should have been like that. We know that we can rely on the government, right? But what we have to realize we we learned through all this is that all we have is each other. Yeah. Even if we can't uh, like be in the same room. Good segue, I think, to. Um, what are your thoughts on San Francisco, the city, now moving forward? I'm coming, excited. Coming about out of, it. I'm saying not done, but coming out of. I'm excited about uh, where San Francisco is going. You know, something like 100,000 people left, and like uh, some of them were people that we loved and had been here for a long time, you know, and a lot of people, but a lot of them, people who didn't really care that much about San Francisco, they were here to make a dollar, and like, whatever, that's fine, but like, you know, if you don't want to be here, don't be here. It's a great opportunity for that. And so, like, People all of a sudden, people who had been stuck in their place for 10 years were able to move horizontally yeah. to a nicer place, you know? Right. And, like, um, you have a lot of opportunity. And, like, we lost a lot. Of, first of all, 
real talk, we, luckily we did not lose that much human life in San right. Francisco, but like we lost the country. Insane. It's something crazy. Yeah, yeah. 600. It's insane, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, yeah, when you think about the Vietnam War, there was 50,000 Americans who died. Right, and that was a big fucking deal. Yeah. But, um, so... I'm, I'm optimistic about the future of San Francisco. There's a lot of space, literal space, where people can, like, maybe grow ideas, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I'd like to end on, so our theme this season on the podcast, season four, is we're still here. Do you want to speak to that idea? You're still here. I'm still here. And actually, like, um, um, before we started recording, I started talking about this. Um, myself and uh, my friend Megan Mitchell, we teamed up, and she works at Hearsay Media, and we, we, we're releasing this uh, web series we did called uh, when the lights come up in the city, and, and we're focusing on three different neighborhoods: uh, the Bayview, North Beach, and the Outer Sunset, and uh, about the people, places, and businesses that helped us get through the pandemic. Awesome, you know. And each one has like a, a sub theme. Like the, the Bayview's theme is like, like a, you know, like we've always had to pivot and we've always had to to figure things out and t- take care of each other. Mm-hmm. North Beach's theme is like. We've been doing this, like yeah. we're just gonna keep doing it, you know. Right, right. And then the outer sun says the theme was like all the stuff, like all the people who like made new things happen, you know. And that's that's kind of the story of the pandemic is like it's like we all figured out like knock on wood how to survive, and we've done this and like um, and we've done it well, if I may. We have. I mean, the, to the, your point earlier, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, we've done it well. It's it's been it's 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 a blessing to see, honestly. But to me, like the, the one of the biggest uh, problems with the pandemic was like. You know the the rise in um, uh, uh, fentanyl deaths is really mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. upsetting. You know, it's real. and it's real because like you know people like just see this. You know, to put things in perspective, we had almost three times as many ODs as we had uh, COVID, COVID deaths. deaths. Correct. Right. And like these are you know, and there's people at home being like, well, these are just drug addicts on the street. Well, that a that doesn't mean they're not people. Right. And b it's not just that. There's like p our friends. I, I had friends who died from this shit. Right. You know, and like they thought they're buying a bag of blow, and it's not that. Or it's mm-hmm. you know, and it's like so if you're listening at home, seriously, like. Drugs are fun. That's cool. But, like, do them safely. Have Narcan. Don't do drugs alone. You know, like, test your... You get fentanyl strips and test that shit because, like, it's, it's killing our, our friends. Right. Anyways. How can people find the show and when does it come out? Uh, the show comes out very soon. I don't know. By the time this... By the time this airs, it'll be out. Yeah, it'll so, be out. So how do, how do folks find it? Uh, uh, you can... Um, I bet you Google when lights come up in this... When the lights come up in the city, you can probably Google that. Um... It'll be on brocastewart.com. Uh, it'll probably be on hearsaymedia.com. Or you can you can ping me on the internet and say, Stu, hey, Stu, where's the fucking thing, huh? That was Brocast Stewart. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, we'll get to know octogenarian ex-school teacher Mary Midget, who goes simply by Midget. Episode 22 drops next Tuesday. Don't miss it. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have more than 160 episodes available on our website storiedsf.com or wherever you listen to podcasts if you can please rate and review our show so we can reach even more folks we love email drop us a line at storiedsf at gmail.com thanks for listening stay strong stay healthy keep dreaming and we'll see you next time on storied san francisco podcast is a proud member of the bff.fm podcast network learn more at podcasts.bff.fm bff.fm best frequencies forever